It's January 18th, 1788, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. So it was on this day that the most successful comedy of the 1700s had its opening night, but it earned little but scorn from critics who said it was too long, badly acted, and simply not funny. That play was The Rivals, and what Richard Brinsley Sheridan did to it next is one of the most remarkable turnarounds in theatre history, because just 11 days later, the play (laughs) would reopen for its second night to almost universal acclaim. It makes you wonder what needed to be tweaked between that terrible opening night at which people threw fruit again. Another of these classic things where people turn up to the theatre with their rotten fruit (laughs) ready to go. How did they change it in that amount of time from an absolute dud into a, a, a classic that also launched a career? Well, they recast it, which is, I mean, not one of the major roles, but one of the supplementary roles. But nonetheless... It's interesting, isn't it, just how often the cohesiveness of a company can be derailed by someone who's not quite pulling their weight or acting in a slightly different style, like they're in a different show. Mm. Um, So they recast this minor role, and also in the 11 days rewriting a process that Sheridan later called prunings, trimmings and patchings, which is how I'm going to (laughs) refer to our editing software from now on. Um, He um, (laughs) trimmed 17 scenes down to 14. So 14 scenes is still a lot, actually, you know, for a modern audience. Uh, But back in um, 1775, 14 fairly zipped along by comparison. So I suppose it made it clearer it was a comedy, really, and, you know, a bit less laborious. Yeah, and the removal of those three scenes actually knocked about an hour off the runtime, which, you know, if you you work for a comedy, an extra hour of uh, forced jokes can be, (laughs) is a little bit much. Are you listening, Judd Apatow? (laughs) And so actually, you mentioned the role that was recast, and Arian, you'd mentioned the fruit. So to just bring those two things together, on the opening night, an (laughs) apple was hurled at this actor. He was playing the role of O'Trigger, an Irish aristocrat. He halted mid-scene and demanded... (laughs) By the powers, is it personal? Is it me or the matter? And it seems like it was a combination of both. The character O'Trigger was seen as a crass mockery of the Irish gentry. I feel like nobody would have cared about mocking ordinary Irish people. Uh, And the actor John Lee was ridiculed for his poor attempt at the accent, which was described as, you know, being like a a mixture of Welsh and Scottish and everything else. Um, But that was just one thing that went wrong on opening night. The Morning Post reviewer the next day complained that Ned Shooter, who was playing one of the main roles, Sir Anthony Absolute, did not know any two lines together, and wherever he was out, he tried to fill the interval with oaths and buffoonery. Yeah, so again, like 11 days being pulled off stage, that's really going to focus the mind on making sure you're better when you come back on, isn't it? Which is, of course, like a process we have for... We. We in showbiz. (laughs) I don't work in theatre at all. (laughs) Us playwrights. But it's a process that we in the business have now of previews, isn't it? That's what they call it in the West End now. You've got a big budget Mm. play, like not even based on material anyone new or a musical but a new play you wouldn't open a new play in the west end to a huge audience unless you tried it like 30 times before you say it's our opening night so that's now Mm. a formalized process i mean it was his first play so he can be forgiven for having made a few gaffes here and there i mean it's another remarkable aspect that it had this massive west end premiere when (laughs) it was his very first play and it wasn't ready i mean there must have been other people who had read it between it hitting the stage and his first writing but it's astonishing as well that he'd written it because he was living beyond his means in bar and he found himself in need of cash and the only thing that he could think of to spin money quickly was to write a play and I just love that as a sort of 1700s money spinner that you're like oh man I'm flat broke I better get to work on like a five act comedy of m- manners <laughs> immediately <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's explain how he was able to get his debut play performed in Covent Garden. And that was because he was already something of a celebrity. Mm. I'd say almost like some tabloid notoriety that he had, if you can transpose that kind of culture, back to 1775. Because he'd made a name for himself in Bath by firstly being, I mean, there's no polite way to say it really, but a bit of a shagger. Like, Mm -hmm. Bath society was a bit different to London society. There was a bit less stringent class mobility imposed upon it. So, you know, you were able, with someone like Sheridan's background from Ireland, to come along and basically get to know quite a variety of different women, which he did, which got people (laughs) gossiping. And then, age 20, he'd fought a duel with a much Mm. older man, Captain Thomas Matthews, 
over the lady that he was courting, Elizabeth Lindley, who went on to be his wife. Uh, he also got another girl pregnant during this period, so the notion of defending her honour was uh, kind of hilarious. But anyway, um, that established his reputation as a gentleman. But then when he won the first duel, Matthew challenged him to a second one, which was much worse, and he got a bit of sword stuck in his ear. Yeah. All of this was lapped up by the newspapers of the time. And so he had then a reputation as, like, cad, gentleman... And someone of, like, principle, someone who'd go back and fight again. So people were interested in him, and he very savvily put all of these themes, chasing young women, silly duels, the English class system, Bath, into his debut play. So it's kind of like the equivalent of, you know, going to see Russell Brand's play. (laughs) (laughs) That was why people went. (laughs) Yeah, and he was from a theatrical family as well. His father was an actor-manager, and his mother was an actress and a playwright. So there was good reason to think that this might actually turn out to be quite a good play. In fact, David Garrick, who at the time was probably the most famous actor in Britain, he was aware of the hype around it. He noted, great expectation in ye public. I'm not quite sure why he was writing Mm. ye public so late in history, but maybe it was an affectation. (laughs) But yeah, the morning after, critics were slamming the play, not only was it too long the comedy they said was crude and unfashionable including one aspect that would go on to be the most famous part of the rivals which is malapropisms Mm. Um, so these are named after the character mrs malaprop in the rivals she is the aunt of the protagonist lydia languish and she makes these slightly incorrect attempts to use fine language that turn her into sort of a ludicrous figure so probably the most famous one is she's as headstrong as an allegory on the banks of the Mm -hmm. nile you are the very pineapple of politeness i have since laid sir anthony's preposition before her you can see that already i feel like we're slightly weary Mm. of the malapropisms to be fair it is a 250 year old joke (laughs) (laughs) i think it survived pretty well yes i know (laughs) But you can see how too many of these would weigh you down eventually. And the problem with the first draft of The Rivals was that although this kind of linguistic error would go on to be called a malapropism after Mrs. Malaprop, in the original draft, all of the characters were doing it all Ooh. the way through. And the overall effect was incredibly exhausting. So imagine three hours of characters just saying the slightly wrong words all the time. It's a good joke, though, the malapropism, because I think everyone can relate to having done it. Mm. That's the thing, isn't it? We all live in fear when we think we're saying something clever, that we're actually just using slightly the wrong word. Yeah. It must have been hugely convenient to finally have a word to put to this, although it obviously came years later after the character. But to have so finely placed a regular linguistic error that so many people do would have allowed us all to laugh at it in ourselves and others equally. Yeah. So I think yeah, I think that's why it works. They do continue to surface. There's a good one from Mike Tyson. After he lost a world title fight to Lennox Lewis, he was asked what his plans for the future were and he said i might fade into bolivian (laughs) (laughs) i actually got a green ink letter from a listener to radio 4 because i didn't know the difference and i genuinely didn't know the difference and they'd spotted it between adverse and averse adverse yeah so i i said um i was not adverse to chinese Mm. food or whatever it was and then i got my green pen out yeah it was you (laughs) (laughs) is that how you guys met (laughs) I mean, the thing is that Sheridan was actually quite funny and, you know, a noted wit in his time. You say that to all the women he harassed, Arian. You read about that. That's problematic (laughs) for sure. woman on his deathbed who he said, I'm going to haunt you. And he wasn't joking. Yes, he said to Harriet Spencer, the Countess of Bespera, whom he'd been friends with and also lovers, apparently. I think he just shagged everybody. Told you, yeah. But he said that he planned to come back and haunt her. And she said, why? He said, because I'm resolved you shall remember me. He just, he did sound like a total jerk as well as being from time to time quite amusing but there was one good one that I enjoyed was which was when he so he'd bought into the Drury Lane theatre as his career progressed and there was a moment uh, in February 1809 where the theatre burnt down I think all theatres just burnt down sooner or later people came to (laughs) expect that that's what theatres did but anyway on on being encountered drinking a glass of wine in the street while watching the fire Sheridan said to reporters well a man may surely be able to take a glass of wine by his own fireside, which I thought is just the most brilliant thing to say when you're watching the tragedy of your own theatre burning down. (laughs) Even to this day, it's one of the few plays from the 18th century that is still frequently revived. The last time it was in the West End was in 2010, Mm. and it starred Peter Bowles and Penelope Keith from To the Manor Born. Oh, that's a classy bit of casting, isn't it? Peter Bowles and Penelope Keith. There was even a musical adaptation of The Rivals. It has the most musicals name of all time. It's just called Rivals! Exclamation <laughs> mark. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> 
tomorrow. The female protagonist, who was pregnant and looked pregnant and made jokes about pregnancy, must have been such a breath of fresh air. Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors.